Well, uh, as you know, the uh, crazy dictator Idi Amin, uh, he said he had a dream and he acted upon his dream the following day by expelling all the Ugandan nations. Uh, he initially gave them 30 days and then with some pressure he made it into 90 days. Uh, literally, that's, that's uh, well, as simple as that. We had to leave. So we left, I think, within 30 days we were out of the country and uh, uh, we came with a, a suitcase and the clothes we wore, which were uh, most unsuitable. We arrived here in, in October, as you know, it was very cold. I was 13 and uh, uh, we spent uh, the first year, more or less, I think about 10, 11 months at the refugee camp at, camp at uh, RAF Greenham Common. I must say we were very touched by the warmth and the kindness of the British people. Extraordinary. Beyond our expectation. I said, you know, I'm not going to go down the route of uh, uh, seven-year education and become a doctor or a lawyer or accountant as one of, uh, as good Asian boys do, but I'm, I'm going to bite the bullet and, 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 and try and make some, uh, something out of uh, now, you know, so that's why between the ages of 14 and 18, I, I did almost every kind of work you can imagine, so working in supermarkets, cleaning the toilets there, and uh, you know, new, delivering newspapers, delivering milk. And at the weekends, I used to work in, at the market. So Saturday was Portobello, and Sunday was Petticoat Lane. So, you know, this is where I really got the feeling and the cut and thrust of, of sort of basic trading. And, and I must say, I really enjoyed it. I liked it, and, and I, was, I was just loved it, just being in there, getting up at 5 in the morning, going with the chap that picked me up, stopping there, having that cup of coffee in that polystyrene cups they used to have with a bacon roll, you know, it's the first introduction to bacon roll, sausage roll. And, and, and they remain my favorites even today. Yeah. So. Ever since I was a, a little boy, I had a, a real passion for cars. And I knew kind of, you know, these were German cars, these were English cars, Italian cars. So it was like a hobby of mine. And every time a car went past, almost with just look, listening to the sound, I could tell you what car that was. And I, it wasn't very often I got it wrong. So then I stumbled upon this uh, uh, bankrupt business. Uh, and uh, initially I couldn't afford it, but as it completely went bust and the uh, owner just shut shop, I had the opportunity to acquire that for a very, very low price. And it was, it was completely, a bit that had finished as a business. So I got in there, I knew nothing about car parts, i be totally honest with you, and just opened the shop with whatever stock there was there. People would walk in and say, well, have you, have you got one of these? And I'd say, well, why don't you come around the counter? Let's look for it. Sometimes uh, we found it. Uh, sometimes, I'll, well, let me get it for you. Then I'd just go and get it from my competition and give it to them for the same price, and just building up a reputation and credibility and, and a name that, you know, we, we were helpful. And, you know, the, previously the shop only opened 9 to 5, and I got in there, it was 7 to 7, seven days a week. There was no Saturday, Sunday, nothing. So lots of hours, lots of passion, enthusiasm. Relationship was day one, you know. You know, sometimes the people would come and say, oh, I haven't got the money. I'd say, eh, don't worry, come back, pay me later, and eventually. You formed these incredible relationships and the business just grew from strength to strength and uh, we were making good profits very quickly. We just took enough money to just survive, so to pay our bills and pay and the food on the table and everything went back into the business for years and years. So, you know, I, I would say these are big sacrifices for anyone contemplating going into business and, and we did that and, and I didn't, it was not, I was not passionate about the business, I think I was obsessed because the fear of failure was so great that uh, nothing could be taken to chance and I, literally it was kind of, that was it, the number one priority in my life. And and in the later years when the real, as you asked, what was the moment, there, there was a sudden shift that the British cars were becoming unreliable, 
the European cars, particularly the German cars, were becoming more fashionable, more reliable, you know, more kind of, a, you know, oh, I'll, I'll have a Audi or a BMW or a, you know, a Mercedes. They were becoming very, very sort of desirable. But there was no parts distribution structures, only the main dealers were involved. So I caught on to the fact that if I can source these parts, nobody else wants to do them. They don't understand them. And uh, uh, so I started specializing in those parts. So that was a big moment. Instead of being everything to everybody, I said, no, there's no way I'm going to uh, climb the ladder fast. So I specialized. And then I used um, uh, what is today social media. In those days, it was print media and radio. I realized the power of this very quickly, that you've got to get your message across to people. And, and, and it worked. And I would literally, every penny that came in the till, once the bills had been paid, I would pay in, in advertising, uh, something like, in those days, 15,000 pound a week. And you could have bought a house for 30,000. So that was my expenditure. And I only had a, two or three shops. To, to be quite honest with you, that, uh, you know, from my very young age, I, I had a tough time, you know, in this country, being a Sikh. Uh, you know, in the early days, it, it, it was, uh, you know, uh, abuse was a daily occurrence, whether I was in my shop or my car and things. And the areas I lived in were, were quite, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of challenging areas, you know, Paddington, Wilsden Green. So, it, it, and I always thought that this country will not be my final home. Uh, so at some stage, the back of my mind, I had that one day I'll get it to this stage. Um, my children would be settled and I could have mentored them into their careers or whatever, and, and I, I would head back home. But uh, it, it was a little premature. Uh, somebody literally knocked the door and said, look, we want to buy a business. We think you're a great guy, and we'll uh, give you as much money as you want to grow it even further. And so they agreed an amount of money, which was really substantial, way beyond I imagined this business to be worth. Plus, on top of that, they offered another $90 million to stay on for two more years. So that took me the, uh, um, into 2015 when I got the payout. So I delivered the, the numbers I thought they were possible as long as they you know, uh, put more stock and more locations. So we delivered what we had to. I got the full pay. And then they said, no, no, you must come on our, on our global board. It's a NASDAQ-listed entity. You know, at, the, at that time, the market cap was about $12 billion. 